early two years versus nine years. This is my brother, David, the smart, good looking one. So thank you, genetics. All right. Um, <laughs> no complaints there. <laughs> so I retired in 2022 with a rental portfolio that my brother, David, called me a moron for having because I have mortgages and he doesn't. And uh, he retired nine, almost nine, coming up on nine years ago with a portfolio of 10 paid off properties because he's not a moron, moron and doesn't want to have mortgages. Uh, so we're here to answer questions from the chat on things we learned in early retirement. So uh, just before we hit recording, David, and I'm going to talk for a minute to give people a chance to get questions into the chat. I appreciate you hanging out with us on this random Friday. I believe it's Friday. Friday live stream. <clears throat> um, I remember it's Friday because we waited. I didn't want to go live at 730 because uh, my friend Michael Zuber from one, one rental at a time does a daily update at 730, but not on Fridays. So we waited for nothing. <laughs> and then you just found out. And here we are. <laughs> and here we are. Uh, before we hit record, David, you were saying the hardest thing, one of the hardest things was in order to reach financial freedom, I think my brother was insane. He would work 10 to 15 hours a day running a tree service, right? The climber, the faller, the topper, the service. And take the money that you earned and buy your rentals. And then you would go for five plus hours a day and work on those rentals because you would buy rentals that needed a lot of work, something that I don't generally do. It's true. Because I'm the lazy one. And That's so you work on them. Yeah, it's very true. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I joined the Marine Corps. It was easier than working with you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so true. But um, so you'd work all day on your rentals, on your business, and then your rentals. And uh, I thought you were crazy. And you said one of the hardest things that you had to do was close down your business. How did, how did that feel? It was very hard for me. I worked hard to build up a good name. And I had a great name. Got a lot done. It was just like I was letting down the people. And I truly loved climbing trees. But it got to where I just wanted to live it up a whole lot more. Start traveling and experience life. You know, it's, uh, it's been a good thing. It works out great for me. I've been in five, maybe six different countries. Been in every state of the United States. I travel everywhere at my own leisure and do whatever I want. And uh, you just can't do that and hold down a, a legitimate business. At least a tree service. Right. So closing it, you felt like a loss of identity and you felt like you were letting your customers down? I truly did. I had really good customer base and I had to pass them on to somebody else. Closed the business all night or hider. Um, so uh, my friend Ryan is also entrepreneurial and, and does handyman work mm -hmm. and you know, contractor stuff. All right. And so he's making a kind of a business out of it. He's literally traveling to Gary, Indiana to do a bunch of work to uh, a new investment that he's a part of. And I could see his, his question being, you had a business, mm -hmm. you had, probably around a hundred, hundred and fifty thousand dollars worth of equipment. And, and for anybody in the business, you had a, a Garrett 10, two bucket trucks, you know, a 45 and a 75, um, a chippers, ton of chippers, dump, dump truck, dump truck right? Let's not talk about the dump truck I stole when I was 15 because I was out of 12 gauge <laughs> shotgun shells. And I get to town and the stupid thing breaks down in the middle of town. We're not going to talk about that. <laughs> so, I'm just glad I got it back. <laughs> <sighs> Older brothers are great. Um, <laughs> I tried when David was retiring to say, this is a viable business. You have a huge client base. You you sold your business when you moved out of California to our other brother who took it over when you left California because you were not stupid and you left California. And you live uh, now in Washington. You could have sold it again, but here's here's the struggle. I, I believe you still have what's called a scarcity mindset. Oh, really? <laughs> so, it, and it's not an insult. It's there's different ways of looking at things. I, I I think there's an abundance. I think there's so much more money than than people think out there, and that, that most of us have access to it. Okay, mm -hmm. but I think a part of your brain, and this is me speaking for you, thinks you might have to go back to work someday. Very true. And because of that, I hung on to all my equipment. It's 
my security blanket. You never know what life's going to throw at you. Uh, you may as well be ready for it. Be prepared. And I still keep my CDL, I guess, in, in the back of my head, but that has like a $300 impact every five years versus you could have sold the business for a significant amount of money, but I you didn't need the money. You had the 10 paid off rentals, which produced more money than you needed to live. Right. <clears throat> so in retirement, is, is there anything that has shocked you that you didn't expect? Wow. That's a tough question. I mean, you're always hit with something. My retirement is based on rentals and you just never know what's going to happen to them. You know, just simple things like a will going out when you're in a different country and you got to scramble and get somebody out there to sink a new well. That's probably the biggest thing that I've had. So hang on. How much money do you have sitting in the bank right now? I usually don't. I know, but I'm asking that. you putting on. They're not listening for a second. They'll, everybody tune out for 30 <laughs> seconds. You just have, you told me this morning. Yeah, that's true. I got a little over 200 grand. Right. And so that sleep well at night account means that those things can happen to your rentals because you're, you are, while you closed your tree service down, you're still running a business. True. And that business has to have the money to handle those, those issues that pop up. So issues that can pop up with your rentals, that was kind of a shock. Or you expected that. Just So nothing just shocked you in retirement? Nothing really. I, I come to expect it. I don't get all excited when something goes wrong with a rental. You just expect it and you plan for it. You save money for it. You line up contractors, you know, could handle those kind of issues whenever you're gone. And it just moves along smoothly if you do it right. Yeah. Uh, so when you were working, running your tree service, were there any other contractors you worked with? Ooh. I worked for all the contractors. And you interacted with them pretty regularly? I did. And I knew which ones, just judging by the work that I saw them doing, which ones I wanted to work for me when the time came. And so here's my question. When you closed down the business and you retired, have you interacted with them since? Well, there's one that's a good drinking buddy. <laughs> Other than that, no, I, I haven't. I see them every now and again. I live in a small town of Yom, and uh, I bump into them every now and again. But that's about it. Okay, because that's the thing I kind of want people to be ready for. It, as you know, you're you're on your financial journey. You're acquiring the assets that are going to pay for your life, so you don't have to sell your life one hour at a time. And we all think we belong to a work family. Beer, the unofficial sponsor of this video, that doesn't pay for it, but makes it possible. <laughs> And that's the only way I can get him on camera. <laughs> it works for me. <laughs> they are not your friends. They are not your family. And when you ran a business like David, or when you worked at a company like I did, when you quit working, here was the shock. You are worse than a stranger to them. Because when you close down a business, you have said... There are more important things in life than this business or this industry. When I quit working at the company, I was on, the name of the school was Commercial Driver School. I was on Team CDS. Everything I did for a decade was to grow, secure, um, improve that company. And as soon as you retire, you have said out loud, there are more things in life that are more important than this business. When somebody working somewhere or a contractor runs into a stranger, they haven't said that. They can interact and talk about their business or their goals. But when you used to work there and you retire, your work wife, your work friends, your whatever you're doing, disappear. Very true. The only time I get reached out is when one of them accidentally watches a video like this and it sounds like I'm complaining. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to reach out. There was a reason why we talked and it was that job. There you go. <laughs> So let me look at the comments here a little bit here. Uh, Jesse, like the way you said United States, because we're all united. <laughs> uh, good stuff. Howdy, everybody. Um, all Nighter Header says, and he agrees with you, there is not enough money in the world. That is why collaterals like treasuries and uh, I'm going to try to say this word, rehypothecated borrowed money. Okay, that sounds like some kind of drug you would do. But... <laughs> yeah. He got me on that one too. It is. It's one of the super smart people. If having a conversation with Ryan is like playing a game of chess with words. Yeah, okay. Which is not a bad thing. That's cool. Jesse says, 
I held on to my construction tools in a shipping container when I moved to Norway a few years ago. Now I'm back in the U.S. to build another restaurant. Glad I kept those tools. Very good. <clears throat> right. So you never know what's going to happen in the future. I When I talk about reaching financial freedom and making work optional, I'll say not everybody's going to be as lazy as me and retire. It means that you could do work you want to, not work you have to. And that could be opening another restaurant. It could be uh, starting something related to trees. That's true. Lots of trees out there. They all need attention. Uh, Bill says a shock to you would be that Dion also became free so that you have a brother to do things with. Oh, come on. We travel all over the place. <laughs> that's what he said. That's, he, I think Bill's aware. And we have been to all kinds of places together and we have all kinds of work. We keep talking about um, going back to Portugal, Portugal or Thailand this mm -hmm. year. Um, so oh, let's do both. <laughs> we should do both. We should do both. Ninja Vanish says you are proof of concept. Oh. That means you mean it, it, it is possible. And one of the reasons I thought you were crazy was working those 10 to 15 hours a day on your business and then five plus hours a day on your rentals. That's, you know, it's basically the whole day. I did too. What I forgot and didn't realize is that there, eventually you flipped the switch. You were working on the rentals because they were what people nowadays call burrs. So you bought it, you rehabbed it, you rented it out, you don't refinance but you do repeat right so you got to 10 paid off rentals once that work was done yeah there is some small things that can happen a well can go up but now you just had a roof done your first time because you did two roofs last year himself i know because he says hey stop by my rental i want to show you something and then we're moving 1600 pounds of roofing material on the <laughs> roof up a ladder it's got to get up there <laughs> it's how lazy i am it's got to get up there but he actually just used my roofing company that i've had a really good experience with clear view exteriors in yelm washington mm -hmm. And they did one of your roofs. They did one of my roofs last month. Um, so those expenses do happen, but we're not the ones climbing on the roof. Well, that's that's true. true. Yeah, the weather was bad, and he could do it in one day, where it would have took me a week or so. So it was time to get somebody else up there. And that's kind of neat. Yeah, and then I think you went off and played with the Bush family and your quads and stuff, didn't you? I did. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> Way more fun than tacking down <laughs> ripping. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> So you've you've been retired. I am going to make a quote. I'm going to quote these are exact words that came out of your mouth. <laughs> okay. I'm coming up on nine years, which means in two or three years, it's like I've been retired a decade. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you have such a way of making me look smart. <laughs> you actually said, hey, I think I'm going to say it this way so it's funny. So I quoted you. That's true. <laughs> making a joke. Um so really, the best thing about being retired nine years is knowing that I've been retired seven years longer than him. <laughs> uh, and and I get to play a card my friend Millennial Mike plays when I say I'm retired. Our friend Matt, the lumberjack landlord, is retired, and Zuber's retired. And Mike says, "Well, I'm half your age. I'm not quite half your age. <laughs> That's true, <laughs> but I am seven years, eight years younger. So we're mm -hmm. on track here." I uh, I would have retired at 42 if you didn't say one sentence. And we talked about that before in a while. Let me know if you want to hear what that one sentence was. He said one sentence that kept me working for a decade. <laughs> Thanks for that. You're welcome. <laughs> You're on track now. Everything's going good. It is. And uh, what is the, so you've been retired coming up on a decade. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the next decade look like? Oh, just more fun. Yeah. I'm glad I did it at a young age. Um, well, I think I'm young. Still do just like about everything. When you retired, so that, that's considered very young for retiring. I mean, right. normally there are people who retire at like 30 nowadays with the way the, the YouTube university works and teaches people how this can be done in like 10 years. Right. But so the next decade. Yeah, just a whole lot more fun. I'm just really enjoying life. It's it's weird. You can wake up and go out and do something or wake up and watch TV if you want to, which I don't do very much of that. But uh, it's a big old world out there. I just want to see as much of it as I can. Have you ever heard of me talk about the math of time? No, not that I know. Okay. So um, I'll do this for the benefit of people watching. There might be somebody who hasn't heard me do this, but I want to explain to you how you've lived almost 30 years in the last decade. Hmm. Okay. So an average person, a normal person, and you, when you were running your business and growing your rentals, you sleep, if you're okay, six to eight hours a day. 
most people commute. You know, so you would drive to a job site an hour in the morning. You'd prep your tools in the morning when you sharpen mm -hmm. your saws and everything. So most people got to go to work. Then they're at work for eight to 10 hours. You would work more than 10 hours. Uh, you'd get home at night. You say you don't watch a lot of TV. And that's because you'd get home at night. And a lot of people do watch TV at night because you're trying to unwind your brain so you can sleep. So in the evenings, you would have a normal person would have around five hours a day that was theirs to do whatever they wanted. You probably had around three. So, you know, you'd have right. put the tools away, take care of You raised two kids that turned into really nice human beings. And uh, you had a spouse for a while. I'm very sorry. Congratulations on the divorce, though. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> have you only had one of those? Oh, oh you're, you're falling one. behind. <laughs> hey, I win at something. Yes. There you go. <laughs> so uh, when you retired... You turned off the business, so no more prepping the tools in the morning, no more commute to the job site, no more working at the job site. The rentals were in place, so no five hours a day or weekends prepping those. So most people, when they retire, so I retired after working 60 hours a week. You still sleep eight hours a day. You still got to exercise and prep food and all that kind of stuff. But you have about 15 hours a day instead of five. And the average person who's working a job, growing their side hustle, investing, those five hours, you're exhausted. Right. In the last nine years, have you been exhausted? Oh, man. When I ride the dunes on my quad, that kicks my ass. <laughs> yeah, definitely which, exhausted. Which exhausted do you prefer? <laughs> Work to where your hands are falling off or on the dunes meeting the interesting people you've oh, introduced very to interesting. on the dunes? You never know what you're going to find in the dunes. <laughs> that is true. How's she doing, by the way? Oh, really good. <laughs> So that's the math of time. 15 hours a day that's yours, you're not exhausted, versus five hours a day where you're exhausted. That's the motivation when you're in that grow your portfolio stage and you see this as a struggle, the first five years are slow, you're putting in all this time and effort, your friends are going off and playing and living on credit cards and racking up debt and buying all those toys that you have that your rentals paid for. David's been retired for nine years. He lived three times more in those nine years than the nine years before that. That's like oh, this 27 years, almost 30 makes, years. Makes sense. And so the next nine years, about how many we have left, um, <laughs> <laughs> we're going to live 30 years. The goal is to get as many people to that to where you live three times more than you were when you were working. It's a good goal. I think so, too. People say fun exhausted is better, too. <laughs> Wake up and play golf, Kip. I totally agree. Um, have you ever played golf? No. No? No, I'm not old enough, and I don't like the funny shorts. <laughs> That's why it's... Can I share it on here? That's why I didn't join the Navy. Right? I mean, there's, there's a couple of reasons, but the bell bottoms. <laughs> was the main reason. <laughs> and I don't even know if they wear those anymore, but... Right. Um, <clears throat> all right, so are there any questions for David, who's been retired for... Nine years, and what was what shocked him? Nothing seems to have shocked you. I think it was what you expected. Pretty much. Uh, for me, a couple of the shocks are the level of energy that you get. I didn't expect. Um, we all say, Michael Zuber says every day is Saturday. I say every night is Friday night. Mm -hmm. um, it shocks me that, I, we, and this happened last night, we don't ever really sleep anymore as a retired person. You just take naps, and sometimes your naps are at night. All right. Um, I'm shocked. So with your sea doo your quad, your scuba, your travel, the occasional, I call them girlfriend du jour. <laughs> um, they keep you busy too. There you go. Uh, <laughs> how did you ever have time to work? You know, I question myself about that all the time. It's really weird. It's uh, also, other than, you know, flying my plane and doing some real stupid stuff every now and again. It's I'm not living a life in danger. I used to have to go up trees that were deadly. And now I could drive by them and think, somebody else has got to do that, not me. And it is really, really cool. <laughs> I, well, there was a period of time where I drove for a local dairy and I wasn't making a lot of money. When I started at the CDL school, I wasn't making a lot of money. And I'd see truck drivers go by Old Dominion, Oak Harbor Freight Lines, Red Away, r &L, you know, making $120,000, $140,000 a year. And a little part of my brain would be jealous. I'd be like, I'm teaching people how to drive trucks. I started making $17 an hour, but I enjoy teaching. I'd be a little jealous of those trucks. When I see those trucks now, I think if I could just get a hold of that guy, like Rick from this weekend, and I can go, 
here's the jobs that pay the most. You take the job that pays the most. Here's how you put the money to work. So you don't have the envy of being in a truck that makes more money. You look at the truck and think, oh, I don't want to chain up. I don't want to couple. I don't want to deal with receiving clerks. Right. All of the things that you wanted when you were working that you realize aren't that good. So when you see a nice deadly tree with a good twist in it and a rotten part above where you have to trim. And power lines and, yeah. and everything else. Yeah, it's, it's neat to just drive right on by. <laughs> it is. And uh, so if so, okay, so here's a question. We haven't really talked about real estate much. Okay. Um, if somebody was starting in real estate today in 2024, okay. how do you think they should do it? Oh, wow. Uh, well, I go for foreclosures. There seems to be deals there. As long as you do your research, make sure you know what you're getting. Um, there's all kinds of information on the internet for that kind of stuff. Um, foreclosures has been probably a third of the places that I bought was all foreclosures. So that's what I would zero in on. Okay. And you bought one on the courthouse step sheriff sale, right? I did. Okay. How did that go? Oh, that was kind of interesting. <laughs> in fact, uh, the auction took place and they were going to quit with the auction. And I said, wait a minute, you got one more place to sell. And the guy says, well, I didn't uh, think anybody wanted it. <laughs> I said, well, I do. He says, well, we're going to go to lunch and if you're here at the courthouse steps after lunch, we'll get that thing auctioned off. And anyway, I bought it for 27000 and change. It was a double wide mobile on an acre and a quarter of land. And the auctioneer, when he sold it to me, he reached over and shook my hand. He says, normally I congratulate people when they make a purchase like this. But judging at the price, I'm not so sure congratulations is the right thing to say to you. <laughs> I mean, oh, come on, no, it ain't that bad. Is, is that the one where I helped you pay it for the cement pad in the back for the... It is. Thing? Okay, and, and what is that currently rented out for? Right now, I'm getting 2000 a month for it. That's terrible. I know. I don't know how you live with yourself. <laughs> it's terrible. How do you sleep at night? <laughs> I'll tell you, on a lumpy mattress full of cash. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm bringing a full circle conversation right now. I uh, have a friend. Mm -hmm. and a couple of friends, really. It's Frank and Cynthia. They live uh, in Southern California. So okay. very sorry for where you live. David has rentals in Kern County. So sometimes it's not that bad. Um, they started a YouTube channel called Old Guy REI. So you should check it out. <laughs> and so we're in the merch. Um, Frank is a contractor that does rehabs. So he runs a business kind of like your tree service. Okay. Episodical, a lot of work, hard work, physical work. In Zoom, Frank looks as tall as me, but in real life, he's as tall as you. No. I was shocked. <laughs> and uh, he sent a $5 super chat, so he bought your next beer for you. Oh, wow. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Frank. <laughs> and he said, David's. it's great to see you. I think he's probably watched a video with you before. Um, he's a moderator on my channel, and this snowball right here means he's been a member for a long time. So oh. he comes to those member meetups that we do. Good. Um, your journey is very motivational. Thank you for sharing. There you go. More than welcome. And a beer. Can't and go a wrong beer. with that. <laughs> and good beer, too. But there you go. <laughs> he don't buy the cheap stuff. <laughs> they make cheap beer? <laughs> Hopefully not. I probably, when I was working, I would have known where to get that. So, Tiffany. Howdy, Tiffany. David, I think I remember that you also invested in mobile homes. What is your opinion of buying mobile homes if you already have land, used mobile homes, and renting them out? I like mobile homes. Mostly because you could work at them from all different angles. You know, you get a stick built house and you got plumbing that's underneath concrete. It now becomes a, a major issue to do some of that stuff. I just really like the mobile homes. Uh, they rent out quick, they're easy. Um, fixing them up, you don't have to spend a lot of money. There are, there's a place called BJ's, it, it's all about mobile home stuff and it's all reduced prices. So for me, it's the only way to go. Quick, easy, and done. So normally when I reference my brothers, I talk about things like, you built a plywood airplane and threw me off the barn twice. Didn't throw you hard enough. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> but sometimes I want to share stories like this, and I'll let you share it. Speaking of mobile homes, um, me and my mom worked in the onion fields when, when you and dad went to Ohio. Mm -hmm. We worked in the onion fields together. And mm -hmm. we moved into a camper behind 
friends' houses. So we're basically homeless. We had a cord coming in the wall with in the window with power. And then my mom accidentally got the job at Rockwell. She went in to apply to be a janitor because she figured she could empty the trash. But since she was so petite, they hired her and trained her to be a tile bonder on the space shuttle. So she went from like $30 a day in the onion fields to $32 an hour at Rockwell International. Mm -hmm. And we moved up in the world to a trailer park. She didn't understand how money worked either. Most of us didn't. Tell us about the story of moving my mom's trailer from one trailer park to another. How did that go? <laughs> well, like uh, like I said, we really didn't have a whole lot of money or anything. And my mother hired a trucking outfit to move that trailer from one to the other. And uh, the trucker didn't show up on time. So I hooked my three-quarter ton Chevy pickup truck, which I still have today, to the thing and went to pull it to another park, which was probably about five, six miles away. But when I went to take off, my truck did a wheelie. The, <laughs> when the truck come up off the ground because it was way too heavy. How many so, of us did you put on the hood? Oh, there were hippies everywhere. There really <laughs> managed to get forward momentum. And once I did that, I took it all the way to that trailer park. And uh, that was a tough little truck. I still have it today. It's a rust bucket, but it still runs. <laughs> I think one of the benefits to having a mobile home is it's mobile. Yeah. And it went where it made sense. And then, then we moved up to a double wide because we moved up in the world yeah. and relocated that to the property where we still have that property where that mobile home is out there. So right. We, um, you and Dale have that one because I don't touch it. Um, so there you go. There's our overshare for the day. I blame it on the um, water that makes my eyes water. <laughs> Uh, so you've told me a few times about mobile homes. Uh, everything's the same, right? Same electric panels, same heaters, like very, very similar things. So once you have the skill set to work on them, nothing really changes. Versus, I most of my houses were built between 1982 and 1995. So that's the era that I like to buy. Right. But I have one from 1921 and 1939. And doing any work in those, I had to re-educate myself on mm -hmm. how all of that worked for versus mobile homes are very similar. Right. Not, not all of yours are mobile homes though. You have the ones in Roseman are stick built. Right. And yeah, I got three stick built houses and there's nothing wrong with them. I've worked on them. I, I know them through and through. It's kind of neat. I, I've worked on every one of my rentals. And when I get a hold of a contractor, cause I'm in a different country or something, I could actually steer them as to what needs to be done. And it just makes it a whole lot quicker and easier. Yeah, I like working on rentals. Uh, I mean, I am retired, but I still like working on them. But I never let it get in my way of vacationing. If something comes up in another country that I just want to go and see and do at that precise moment, um, I leave. Just let somebody else handle it. Favorite part of Portugal? The Algarve. The Algarve? Oh, yeah. But also, yeah. that's the <laughs> whole thing, right? <laughs> um, so, okay. Albufera or Lagos? Albufera was okay. by far the, the destination for fun. Because there's women. <laughs> oh, there sure are. <laughs> okay. uh, I like the Benigil case. I, li I like the water. The, the main favorite part. Wow. Yeah. There you go. Favorite part of Thailand. Pretty sure they were women. Thailand. Favorite part. Don't spit your beard out. I'm not going to say that. You go ahead. Okay. <laughs> okay. The actual. Patea was a, a nice little city there, too. If I'm seeing it right, this is what you look like when you blush and you're bald. So, <laughs> and I'll say, well, I am kind of red. <laughs> we're not, we're not oversharing that much. Um, did you have a favorite part of Thailand? I mean, was Patty really your favorite? I mean, yeah, the, I got the video of you being drugged off the street. Uh, I have a hard time remembering some of the places we went to, but there was an island we went to and we dove all around it. And so, the they, scuba dive, so Katow, the uh, first island was Katow. Kalfanong was the one we went to where they had the three-day full moon party. Right. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I kind of remember that. Yeah, so for if, three if days. <laughs> Kalfanong in Thai Thailand is good. The scuba diving is a little more expensive. It could be $20 to $30 a dive versus we were $8 for two dives in the morning, two dives in the afternoon. They feed you lunch on the boat. Right. Like, Katao was my favorite too. Chiang Mai was nice. I, it was very historical. You get a lot of the, the culture and everything, but we're mostly into scuba diving. We do make jokes about... Two guys traveling, but it is scuba diving. And Bangkok didn't do much for me. It was just a bustling city. It's that is the LA of Asia. It is. It really was. But you get out anywhere, any direction from there, and it was nice. 
know, if you make the trip to go that far, I think you've got to, like we have, spend at least a month, you know, month and a half, and really enjoy it. It's a it's a long flight. You may as well be there for a while. I I saw so that's one of the hard parts of working is is your your overlords give you two weeks a year for vacation and sometimes don't want you to take them together. So if the travel to get to a country, I think Colombia was even Thailand was. 15 to 19 hours and then Colombia was 25 to 30 hours because of the layovers and how it works to, right. to get, actually get there and to get to where you, the part of the country you want to go to. Um, a month is, is to me to actually experience the culture and to relax and not be in travel mode. A month was kind of the minimum. Right. I think Portugal, the two months that actually felt like a trip compared to Colombia okay. and Thailand. We did one month each and that felt like, okay, we're, we're here. We got to experience everything. Um, right. Those, those one month trips before I retired taught me how to retire. I don't, I don't know if I've ever told you this, but the first week we get somewhere, we're like, okay, here's the list of things we have to do while we're here. Right. right? We get to, to Portugal. We're like, we, we, we want to see the Benigil caves. We want to see where I think it says where Europe begins out there in um, Sagres. Right. Right. So way out at the end, we actually walked out to the end of the dirt yeah. right there. It's like, <laughs> it's like going to the Florida Keys, but on the other side of, of Europe. So you do that for a week and then you have these three weeks or the next month and a half left. And we basically decided every day we're going to do one thing, right? Just, just, we have one thing planned the rest of the day. It's wake up whenever you want, go to do whatever you want. Something might pop up that you can go do. But when you retire early, I think the easiest way to like always feel interactive and feel like you're doing something is think of every day. What are you going to do that day? And it could be, traveling to see something new. It could be traveling to see friends. It could be a project around the house. It could be whatever, but you have that one block of time. And that's what we did when we were traveling. And that's kind of how I've planned my retirement. Right. Um, Joel says, my brother was a dive master at Big Blue. Oh, very cool. What dive shop? It was named uh, the Caribou, right? It was named after an animal. I believe right? so. And uh, it was great. The, right next door, there was a, there was, there was a if you go diving in, in in Thailand, Joel, and you're certified already, mm -hmm. what we did is we stayed at a dive school. So the instructors mm -hmm. would have morning and afternoon training sessions, and then in the morning or afternoon, the ones that weren't working would go on their dives. And if you're already certified, that's who you go with. So you see the dives that the instructors want to see when they're not training. And so we stayed at the Caribou. It um, was, was great. Weird travel hack. Normally in the United States, if you're going to go somewhere, I'll go on Travelocity and I'll book a hotel and they buy a bunch of rooms. So they get a discount. So I'll get it cheaper than if I call the hotel itself, even with like a military discount, it's cheaper on Travelocity. When you travel in Thailand, since there's a fee associated with, with uh, that, it was cheaper to call them or walk in the door and book the room than it was a month early to book it on Travelocity. So right. Thailand's very different than everywhere else we've traveled. You are... Open water, advanced. Have you done anything beyond that, like search and rescue or? Uh, night trucks. Uh, I have actually searched for bodies, but not, not part of a right. search and rescue team. Nice. I have not done much more. So dive master would be would be fun, but it seems like a job now. Right. <laughs> so. Very true. Uh, Kip S. asks, hey, Dion, is the Medford to Klamath area decent enough to invest? That sounds like Oregon. It is. Okay. It is a, a bustling little area. It's, it, it's good, good. You've got the I-5 corridor going through there. Here's the things you would want to know investing in Oregon is, um, like California, there's rent control and it's not as um, landlord friendly, which doesn't mean don't invest there. It means you have a different strategy for investing there. Grant Cardone's been on Bigger Pockets a couple of times. And in one of his episodes, he talked about how he prefers blue states that aren't landlord friendly because they limit building. When you limit building, you see what we've seen here in Washington, because this is pretty much a blue state too, of over 45% appreci appreciation in the last three years. Like you've gained, you have a couple hundred thousand dollars in the bank. That's nice. You've gained about $800,000 in value in the last three years on your properties. Right. That doesn't suck. So I'm not saying invest for appreciation. I'm just saying it's a byproduct of investing in a place that is not landlord friendly because they're also, the laws that line up without being landlord friendly also restrict building. Know the rent control laws. An example is in California, if a property, a single family house, house with an ADU or a duplex is in your own name, 
There is no rent control. If you put it into an LLC, it is now rent controlled. If you're in Oregon, I don't know if that's the case, but I do know that if you buy a small multifamily, so house with ADU, duplex, a triplex or fourplex, and you occupy one of the units, so you're house hacking like I did at my duplex and my fourplex, and the duplex that we're in right now, mm -hmm. um, it's not rent controlled if you're owner occupying one of the units, right? So understand the laws and how it impacts you, and don't think that rent control is not a reason to buy there. What it does is it makes you rich, and it makes more tenants homeless. So yes, I would say that's probably a decent place to invest. I in in Washington, I avoid King County or the Seattle area. In Oregon, I would avoid Portland. So if you're asking me that about Oregon, I would like the places that you named. Uh, Bill has a question for you, David. Um, how many rentals did you have before the income snowball kicked in from work and rentals before you started paying them off? So they're they're thinking that you did it like me, like you invested and all of a sudden you started making a lot of money, but you did the home equity line of credit route. You want to tell me how that worked? Yeah, I uh, <laughs> used the home equity line of credit to purchase these places, like you just said. But I would say it was probably three rentals when it finally got to be fun. When I realized that, wow, this is really happening. This is really working. What it did for me is it made work optional. I didn't necessarily have to go to work. I went to work because I really loved doing trees and everything, but I had money coming in that was actually taking care of me quite well. I do enjoy buying fixer-uppers. I like to find something that I could tweak just one way or another and really get good rent out of it. You know, adding a porch, adding a bedroom, expanding the kitchen and cabinet spaces, stuff like that. So the snowball, to answer your question, after three, it just got easier and easier and more money kept coming in. Um, I got some money in the bank right now. I'm told by my accountant I better spend it on a rental or give more of it to the IRS. And I guess I'll be out there getting another rental. Um, I now am not so sure I'll work on it. I think I'll probably hire the majority of the work done. I'll oversee it, but uh, I'm pretty slow at doing the work on the rentals. And if it takes me a while to get something done, that's rent that I'm missing out on. So why not hire a contractor that's good at it and quick? So it's a snowball effect now, but I'm looking for that that snowstorm that just never stops. Just <laughs> keep it coming, baby. <laughs> it's, it is so weird that um, even if you run out of money, you basically just think I'm going to wait a month. Very true. Yeah, when you purchase something and you realize, well, you know, I could... Pay that off in three months with the money coming in and still have plenty left over. That makes the decision making a whole lot easier. You know, adding a, a room onto a house, you know, that's an expense. You know, anywhere is between fifteen to twenty thousand, depending on the room. But when you know it, you can get it paid for in three months, just sitting back and taking it easy. It's like not even sticking your neck out there at all. If either one of us was good at math, I would have a debate, but we're not going to have a debate. I'm just going to let you know I paid off one of my properties yeah. and it cost me a million dollars. So I'm curious, paying off your properties, how much that has cost you. Yeah. Okay, you're talking way over my head now. <laughs> That's okay. We're not good at math. And financially free is financially free. There is not more financially free. Right. Good. So, um, Rob has a question for you. David. Would it surprise you to know that your brother spent his time in Vegas chasing showgirls around the Strip? <laughs> Not at all. Hell, I had him in Thailand. You should have seen him there. We're not talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> or showing the videos. Uh, okay. We're not going to talk about those five or six women that were dragging you into that place. <laughs> you were kicking and screaming. I was proud of you. <laughs> Go ahead. I hear mom calling me. I still miss you, mom. You know, I miss dad, too. Um, keep going says, any tips on choosing an exterior paint color for a rental house, dark or light? Well, depending on the exterior, like if you got party plank, if you're putting that up, you got to use caulking. What I like to do, and it saved me money in the past, is choose a color caulking that matches the paint. It uh, saves you money in the long run when you'd have to do more caulking because caulking fails after a while. You don't have to repaint the house. You can go with the same color caulking and be way ahead of the game. I do the same thing with the interior. 
And I'd choose everything that way. If there's nail holes in the wall, you could take a little dab of caulking and fill a nail hole without painting the whole wall. So I base all my paint on the colors of caulking. Works for me. It might sound strange, but it That's does. brilliant. I love it. I have not done that. I have done the clear caulk where it starts off white, fades to clear towards transparent, kind of for the same issue. So it's easier to paint over, but then I do still have to have the paint around to fix it. Right. So I like that With idea. With the clear caulking, make sure it's paintable. A lot of the clear caulkings out there, you can't paint and it becomes a, an issue. You've got to carve it out to, to repaint a room. So a lot of the clears just cannot be painted. And then um, Old Guy RAI says darker colors seem to attract more heat. And All Nighter Hider, Ryan says the lighter colors don't fade as fast as darker colors for house exteriors. True. Good points. Uh, I love it. I love the idea of the same color as the cog, caulking. As you put it in. Huh. Brilliant. My goal. So David has done basically a rehab on every property you've purchased. Mm -hmm. And or added rooms. I remember being there for that. All legally with permits in case the IRS or anybody else is watching. <laughs> but of course. Of course. <laughs> That's a lie in case you want to catch me <laughs> between the lines there. Hey, um, uh, I don't want to do that. You see the rehab that I have going on here. I keep telling everybody this is my first and last rehab. And they go, oh, why is your last one? I'm like, so this one rehab is creating $250,000 that didn't exist six months ago. Right. And I don't want to do it again. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> Crazy, huh? I don't know. I just enjoy rentals. I really do. And I like putting people in and eating at the house. And you find good people out there and you feel like you're actually doing them a favor. You know, it's, they're paying to live there, but I don't charge the most I can possibly get out of it. And if they're good to my rentals, pay on time. I very rarely ever raise their rents. It's just a, it's a good feeling. I lived in a rental, well, only one while growing up. Let me rephrase that. We had rentals while I was a kid, but when I, as a young adult, I only rented one place and that bothered me. It was less than 400 bucks a month I was paying, but that was throwing away money in my opinion. And when I had the chance to buy a house and no longer pay rent, that, that was huge for me. And if you think about it, 400 bucks is nothing, but back then. It was, Where was the first was place we actually paid rent? Was that 60th Street? Yes, yeah, 60th Street. Um, Actually, 40th Street was okay. part of that. So, and you were probably... I was in the 14, 7th grade. 15, yeah, right. So, part of that, we lived in rentals. They just didn't know it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> My dad had a tendency to find empty houses and just move us on in. And after a while, you know, the owner would come by and say, what are you doing in our house? <laughs> and, and then it, it was Haskell Canyon where they said, why don't you just pay 50 bucks and we left? Yeah. Yeah. It's great. Change school districts because you don't want to pay $50 a month. Right. I still miss you, Dad. <laughs> um, I spent the last... Yeah. Um, yeah. Get off that subject. Um, hey, Dion, Manuel, howdy, and thank you, Manuel. You made live streams possible at the Zuber event. Is your brother going to start his own YouTube channel? No, I'm not into computer. I... Uh... I guess this is a, called a podcast. <laughs> I've only been on what four or five of them with you, and that's over uh, several years. So, so you know how you like to provide a good house, and you take care of it, and you put your craftsman skills into it, and you keep your rents low, and you're helping those tenants rent a place. Right. There's a lot of people that would like to pick your brain and get into your knowledge and make their life better, so they can make their tenants' lives better. And you're not denying them that by not having a YouTube channel, but that's okay. <laughs> There's no guilt here. Well, it sounds here. bad when you here. put it like that. <laughs> No, I'm just not into computer. It's it's not my thing. And if you knew how, look at his face. If you knew how much beer it took to get him to this point, and yes, this is a live stream. It is now nine oh five in the morning. Um, and remember, as our friend Dan says, you can't drink all day unless you start early. That's true. Very true. <laughs> um, people said mind blown by the uh, caulking thing. Good job. Yeah. So you you brought a, a unique thing to this video. It really works. You just walk up with the clock in and tell them to match with the paint. It just works really well. I also go with good paint. Don't waste your time with lousy paint. Good paint to uh, last forever. I like to go semi-gloss because it can be washed and it stays on the walls 
almost forever. I'm so. sitting on a five gallon bucket of paint. I was going to lift it up and show the pen I use. <laughs> but yeah, I do. I, I do agree. Don't skimp on the paint. Um, one thing that David taught me after the first couple of times I've, I've done some painting is the one thing I'll kind of do at my rentals. I, I want that attention to detail done. Um, I was buying the wrong nap, right? When you buy your rollers, uh, there's quarter inch, you know, one third, half, whatever, but you want three quarter inch nap at least. And so the thicker the nap, the easier the paint goes on. Yeah, you do probably go through a little bit more, but it's one coat. Like I don't think I've had to two coat almost anything unless it had a really dark thing that was covering. Right. Uh, so three quarter inch nap, at least. Yeah, if there's any texture at all, I, I prefer three quarter inch nap. Anything bigger than that, you're just wasting paint. Anything smaller than that, you can't get enough paint on the roller to actually <laughs> paint it in a reasonable amount of time. I totally agree. And then you have the, you have shown me with three quarter inch nap, when you're done, before you throw that roller away, you can get about a half a quart or a pint or something out yeah. of that roller. You want to mm -hmm. squeeze that roller, get a plastic bag, and basically milk that roller to get the paint out of it because it holds a lot of paint. And paint's expect really expensive. Now. It is, yeah. But you don't want to waste it. Um, Bruno, howdy. How was Vegas? Vegas was great. Uh, we've been to Vegas a couple of times. The last time I think we went to Vegas was like just before the Thailand trip. Right. Um. David's not a Vegas fan. Um, we live too close. Went there too many times. I worked there for a while. If you're getting out of the Marine Corps, can't talk about that. Yeah. I um, go to the Dumont Dunes, and you can see the lights of Vegas from that far. The glow of Vegas. You can't really see the lights. But I spent a lot of time in the dunes riding quads and side-by-sides and bikes and girls and stuff like that. But anyway, that's more fun to me than going to Vegas. Did you say riding bikes and things and girls <laughs> and oh, stuff like that? that then, did you? <laughs> nice. Well, everybody's like their own channel. Lars says, good evening. It was nice to meet you at the o Red event. It was great to meet everybody that was there. That was, I think that was the best, like, convention gather thing I've ever been to. And I've been to a lot. Um, yeah. Looking forward to next year already. Uh, Michael, do you have the tenant signing the lease agreement and pay the deposit in first and last month just the day they are moving in or days before? In order for me to sign the lease, uh, let's ask, ask uh, if you, you answer the question, you're the guest. Sorry, I know you were reaching for the beer, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got to talk My again. Jeff Dunham <laughs> came out there for a second. <laughs> do you have the tenant sign the lease agreement and pay the deposit in first and last month's rent the day they are moving in or days before? Usually whatever works best for the tenant. And sometimes they take a few days to get in there. And I know it's an empty house, but they're not quite in it. So I, I work with the tenant. I know that's probably the wrong thing to do. Um, you're you know, throwing away money, but you're also starting out a good relationship with your tenant. They know that you're not just after their money. So how many tenants have you physically ejected from your house? And you can't say zero because I was there for the Rosemary ones. <laughs> Oh, there's been a couple. Okay, right. So if you follow the law and you want your tenants to, <laughs> I don't know that I would do it the, the what we call the McNeely way, but we'll say the redneck way. Um, I've been there with you. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah. So if you want to follow the law, here's how I do it. I, I like the way you do it. You know, you're personable. You're bigger than most people. You know, it works out for you. I don't let anybody move in until I have received. I don't let anybody sign a lease until I have collected the deposit, right? So if it was, if it was gonna be done through DocuSign, I would have them Zelle, Venmo, maybe not Venmo, it'd be Zelle, or go into a bank and deposit with a cashier's check into my account. Their deposit, first month's rent, and any prorated rent if they're moving in before the first. Then I sign leases, because a lease is binding whether they've paid it or not. And if they move in and you have a lease, it's now a full eviction, unless you walk in and carry them out. That's true. Okay. Some people are just a little bit more fun to get rid of than others. <laughs> they are. Um, so all of that happens for me at or before lease signing. And um, yeah, I think that answers that. But we don't charge last month's rent. I don't charge last month's no. rent. No. Um, I don't want the tenant thinking there's a free month as long as they move at the end of their lease. And some areas don't even let you do that now. And, and if you think about it, Deposit, first month's rent, proration if they're moving in before the first, pet fees. I mean, it could be four to six grand to move into a place and you had last month's or seven plus. Um, right. That is 
a significant amount of money. I don't want to make the tenants do that. So and security could be more than a rental payment, which is something I actually do. <laughs> so, so let, that they let's, know. Let's, let's go over the new laws. <laughs> it can't be more than your rent now. Oh, it's so well since I had yes, I specifically make sure that my deposit is not the same as the rent. It's a little bit less, so it's clear that it's not a last month's rent. And yes, and I three, I was going the other way. If it's three four years, you would want to go more, and I would too. I'd have a higher deposit, and I have gone. Um, well, as I've recommended, some friends do. If you'll agree to a higher deposit because you have a lower credit score or something, sure, we can move you in and, and take care of that. But know your local laws, where your rentals are, and, and understand, are, is a deposit allowed to be more than a month's rent right. before you do that? So I wasn't cutting you off saying you're doing it wrong. I'm saying some people live in different areas than we do, hmm. and they might have different rules. So wouldn't it be cool if I give back their deposit only what the rent is? Because that's the rent. rent you're allowed to go. They want to get in trouble. <laughs> My last three tenants that moved out got their full deposit back. They were I'm really good awesome. about that. Yeah. And there are some people that, there was one girl in Southern California that rented from me. And she told me she was leaving, gave me a 30 days notice. I showed up, tools in hand, ready to work, and there was nothing to do. That place was immaculate. It's the best I've ever seen. So she got her deposit back plus five hundred bucks. And I had to mail it to her. And she contacted me three or four days later whenever the mail caught up to her. She said, you paid me too much. I said, well, you gave me a vacation. I came down here to work, and all I had to do was rent it out to somebody else. Thank you very much. So, yeah, I'm very fair when it comes to that kind of stuff. Take care of my place. I'll take care of you. <laughs> so um, do you know how you grow your rental portfolio? <laughs> so so, so here's, a, here's a really quick way to grow your rental portfolio. Julie says... Your brother is marriage material, and Julie has rentals. Oh, wow, cool! So, poof, you have a bigger <laughs> rental program. But right. Julie, she says, I, she says, he's marriage material. I like him. I don't want somebody who bugs me. So you come across as a person who doesn't bug people. Oh, well, very nice. She's never said that about me. She's commented <laughs> for years. So I bug people. So that's Julie. That's Julie Anderson. I believe lives not too far from here. Very nice. Comes to the Tacoma F. Well, she can come to the Tacoma F. I meet up. All the jokes I made about you in this video, and she thought that's that's marriage material. <laughs> um, Ryan, I am by the way single. <laughs> he is single. Would we like to go over the list of reasons why? <laughs> <laughs> Ryan says he would like to bet you that he's more of a tech tard than you are. Yeah, <laughs> um, I don't know. Ryan, you did a live on YouTube, so. Uh, David, what is the difference in maintaining a manufactured home versus a stick built? You own both. What's the difference? Yeah, the biggest differences. Give me like top three. Well, I, I like the fact, like I said earlier, a, a mobile home you can come at from all angles. You can pull siding off and get to everything. You can come in from underneath. Um, it's all just straightforward and easy. Some of the stuff is a little bit cheaper in a, a mobile home. Um, stick built, you know, if you keep them up, it's really good. Um, but then you got earthquake damage and stuff like my stick builds in California, I've had earthquake damage on two of them. Um, just because it's concrete on the ground and there are shakes down there and stuff starts crumbling. So that's a, the two main things. Um, you could also go to a manufacturer of the mobile home and get all the schematics on it if you don't have the little paper that's supposed to be next to the electric box that tells you where everything goes. That usually gets ripped out. But you can look it up and see everything, and that's kind of nice. The older houses that I have, they were built in the 30s, 40s, right around there. You know, permits weren't necessary, so you're guessing with everything you do. So I you like actually mobiles. ripped out all the knob and tomb wiring and put in wires. I did. It was bare wire going to uh, porcelain isolators. When, when did you do that? Oh, as soon as I got shocked. <laughs> but but about what year do you think? Before two thousand? After two thousand? Oh, before two thousand. It was yeah. probably in the in the nineties. Was it before or after I lived in there? After. That's what I figured. <laughs> I didn't care. You burned it. So <laughs> after getting out of the Marine Corps, I was I was homeless for a while, and then um, eventually got on my feet and moved into one of his rentals, um, which had knob and tube wiring, because I went in the attic, too. Yeah. And then I was like, huh, that wire bites me. 
<laughs> yeah, that's so, all taken care of. It's all taken care of now. Good job. Um, <laughs> and by the way, thanks for charging me full rent when I rented your rentals. That's good. Never give friends and family discounts. You sign a lease. You treat them like anybody else. You don't rent to them until they do like I did. Got the down payment, the deposit, and that credit score that you're requiring. Um, I absolutely agree with that because I've got a nephew, a daughter, and a close friend that rent for me now, and it is treated just like here's the <laughs> lease. Here's Very how late fees work. Um, I don't recommend that when you're first starting because you haven't developed the backbone to stick to your lease yet. But once you have your systems in place, then I'm okay with renting to the friends and family that you think it will go well with. If you have a friend or family and you have your systems in place, but you know they're like all of our cousins, you just don't rent to them. Right. Uh, that was... All Night Heidi says that was the best event he's attended. Knowing that we're going to get the recording made me, you know, really freed me up to mingle. I agree. I was able to kind of sit in another room and do interviews, which are all coming up slowly. Thank you all who took the time to come and talk to me. Um, but I don't feel like I missed anything. And, and those people shouldn't feel like they missed anything because we can watch the recording after, which is great. Ninja Vanish. Howdy. Do you allow someone to move in mid-month? Do you prorate the first month? I heard some landlords have tenant pay full price for the first month and then prorate the second month. Do you understand what all those words meant? I do. Okay. <laughs> I actually prorate it a lot. I prorate it. It's just the way to go. It's easier. I do like uh, rents to come in between the first and fifth of every month, and whatever it takes to get them in. And yeah. prorate. So I, I prorate per day um, early, and I want deposit, proration, and first months. I don't want to have a tenant move in and then one week or two weeks later have a rent payment due. I want that if they, they have the ability to do it moving in, I'm fine with it. Um, sure we're not missing anything here. My Ross says, enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. I gotta get back to work and you're welcome to your next event. Bring David. Nice. He brought me vodka, so you never know what you're going to get when you show up. Ooh. Somebody might bring you a beer. <laughs> uh, next event that I am going to is the Northwest Action Summit in Vancouver, Washington, just outside of Portland. You went with me last year to that. Mm -hmm. And me and Millennial Mike are going. Michael Zuber is keynote speaker, and Christian and Cody are going to be there. There's probably, I think, that eighty you guys should be there because it's kind of Oregon, his backyard. So May 3rd and 4th, Northwest Action Summit. Not my event. I'm just going to talk. Aaron, jumping on from North Carolina. That sounds like a real place. <laughs> Born and raised in Washington State, 24 years in South Dakota, now in North Carolina. South Dakota is an interesting place to go. The Clutes went to North Dakota, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Hank Hill, are all your mobile homes on land that you own? They are, every one of them. So the reason for the question is a lot of people will buy a mobile home in a trailer park, a right. mobile home park, and then they kind of collect rents, but they're paying a lot fee that can go up at any point in time. Early on in my rental history, I guess, I bought a mobile home and I put it in a mobile home park and everything was fine. I had to pay the park its fees and everything, but I was collecting rent. It was actually my very first rental. But anyway, uh, I moved to Washington State and left that mobile home in a mobile home park in California. And then they sent me a letter saying that I could no longer rent it out to anybody. When the tenants that are in there move, I had to move in it myself or pull the mobile home out. And for that reason, I'll never buy something in a mobile home park unless it's such a nice thing that I know I could move to their property and somehow make it work. But never again in a mobile home park because there's rules and regulations that you can't foresee and you just have to live with. Here's the biggest difference between a mobile home and a stick built house. I, I let David give his answer because he used a home equity line of credit to buy the properties, paid that off, rinsed and repeat until he had 10 paid off properties. The biggest difference between mobile homes and stick built houses for other investors who don't have the equity in their house to do that or the ability to pay it off as fast is lending. There are times when lending fear is high and they go, we will not lend on mobile homes. Then it comes down a little and they go, we will only lend on mobile homes that have been moved once or twice. And then sometimes you have a housing shortage and, a, and an administration that says we're encouraging ADUs, we want you to build, and we're going to encourage lending on mobile homes. So 
in five years, who knows what that's going to be like? Uh, oh, my door is in. I need, I need to answer that. I don't think we need a voicemail. Okay. I ordered a door. Um, Rob asks Dion, given my success with midterm rentals, are you considering it? Um, all of your tenants are long term? Sign leases? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Every one of them. Why is that? <laughs> Why? <laughs> what what if you could make three thousand dollars a month instead of fifteen hundred dollars a month? I just don't like to have the rapid turnover and all that. I like to get used to tenants in there and just know I got steady money coming in. Uh, I, I've just never had the short term rentals. Nope. Just never pursued it. So I like fire and forget. Buy a thing, never think about it. Talk to the tenant once or twice every couple of years. Uh the exception is that I'm in my current and first and last burr, and the other side is going to be a long-term rental. My side, since it is furnished, and I'm going to spend at least half of my time out of the country, I will probably short-term rental it to have just extra income for the heck of it while I'm gone. But I don't want mid-term or short-term rentals in any of my other units because I have tenants that were there seven to 15 years before I acquire the property that have been there a decade. And I like low tenant turnover, not thinking, not quite, I'm, I'm not, I, so here's a, here's a thing. You're an entrepreneur. You ran a business. Mm -hmm. You had one job when you were like 17 in a restaurant. Yep. didn't like it. Okay. I've always been a W2 employee, right? Joined the Marine Corps, worked in law enforcement. It was a truck driver out of the CDL school. So I've always had that W2 mentality. An entrepreneur, I think, sometimes is more likely to do midterm or short term because you're running a business. So if you had your rentals and you didn't have the tree service when you were 30, sure, I could double my income. But we're both financially free, want to travel, want to not think about it. And when something does happen at a rental, we just take, you know, a couple of phone calls or emails. You saw when we were in Portugal, I had like three refrigerators and four water heaters go out like all at once, everything was happening. And it was phone calls and texts. Yep. Midterm would be more than that. Uh, Aaron says, I actually met you and Mike at Robin Hood Conference. Dion, the three of us went and ate at Denny's. One of uh, the three of us went and ate at Denny's. One of these days. We had midnight Denny's meetups in Vegas. We we did that at midnight. We had like, hmm. the first night there was probably 10 of us. That night there was like 20 plus old yeah. Denny's. One waitress hmm. was running like crazy. She was happy that we were there though. All those beautiful restaurants in Vegas and you guys go to Denny's. Wow. <laughs> I can't remember the last time I went us? to a Denny's. <laughs> Do you know us? Uh, what's wrong with Denny's? <laughs> uh, nothing. <laughs> David's properties are not out by 29 Palms. They're close to Edwards Air Force Base in a little town called Armpit, California. <laughs> Rosemont. 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 Yep. So, bottom edge of Kern County, just outside of LA County. Uh, a lot of people say, I can't invest in California because the home prices are too high. Well, get out of Silicon Valley, get out of San Francisco, like Zuber did. He lived in Sacramento, but invested in Fresno. Um, I get out of LA County, Kern County, Bakersfield, Taft, right? Roseman, Mojave, maybe California City. That city hasn't completely died yet. No. Probably don't think I want to one out there, but... Um, I camp and ride out there, and it's just not the best place for rentals. I think you're almost out of beer. I'm good for now. Okay, so uh, unless there's any other questions coming up, we're probably going to be wrapping this up. Uh, David doesn't do social media, so if you have any questions, direct them to me. I will put my email in the chat, and I will find out his response. The biggest thing with rentals is just getting started. It doesn't have to be big. It doesn't have to make you a lot of money. If it just even just barely does better than breaking even, it's something. You could always improve your property a little bit and get the income bigger. And once you get your first rental, I just think it's a, a lot of fun. It gets easier and easier. Just got to get started. Hold that for a second. <laughs> oh, really? What are you doing? <laughs> so, Damascus Steel, K-Bar. You should know what K-Bar is. 
Okay. Last question. And this determines if you're still in the family or not. Oh, 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 oh. You better put that down. <laughs> Trump or Biden? <laughs> I don't think Biden qualifies to be a president of a chess club. Trump all the way. Okay. All right. Fine. You can stay. Nice. nice. We'll end this with a hug then. <laughs> Thank you all for hanging out with us. David's awesome. Until my next video, thanks for coming to our Dion and David talk.